Welcome to the Elevate Podcast, conversations with women changing the face of business. And now your hosts, Christy Wallace and Maricela Herrera. Hello and welcome to the Elevate Podcast. This is your host, Christy Wallace, with my co-host, Maricela. Hi, Maricela. How are you feeling today? I have my voice back, so I'm doing good. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I know you you lost your voice. We had Megan filling in for you. She did a spectacular job, um, but we certainly missed you. And uh, you're just getting back from a vacation. Yeah, so are you. <laughs> we have- both are. We both are. I feel like our it, it, it like was uh, across our entire company. Everyone leaned in hard to uh, for to trips during spring break ish time. Just felt like a much overdue, uh, you know, time to to just get outside of your neighborhood or your house, if you will. Yeah, I feel like we all needed it. I had a great trip. I surprised my family. Uh, well, my brother knew I was doing this. He's he's the one that came up with the idea and made it possible. But um, I surprised the rest of my family on their family trip that I wasn't supposed to go on in the Bahamas. And it was an adventure getting there, as, as I've told you. I, it, it involved everything from not knowing where I was going to being picked up and left at an airport, which I am being very nice calling it an airport, to going into a little tiny puddle jumper plane and landing at one of Pablo Escobar's airstrips. But I was fine and it was great. <laughs> that is amazing. And, and getting to spend time with your family, I know you uh, you were separated from them for quite some time during the pandemic. So you're making up for lost time and also building some memories with the new little one. Yeah, my nephew was uh, five months old and and it was his first trip and we were all there and it was so much fun to see him. And I can't wait to see him again. I'm seeing him and I'm going to London to visit them in about a month. So a lot of travel for me, but it is to make up, like you said, for time without my family, which I hope everyone is doing if they had to be away from them. Um, yes, wow. I was actually j- just having a conversation with my with my husband about our son's baseball, and um, but it is I, I swear it is relevant to this conversation, which is he had had a rough game yesterday, and he kept you know getting caught up in the emotion for some bad calls or bad plays, and we had to talk to him about you know not keep not getting stuck in, you know, the past and, and what were wrong, but like focusing more and, you know, you still have a game to play in the future and positive attitude. And then you can always, um, after the game, you know, review everything and kind of look for, you know, opportunities for improvement or, or what have you. But um, that's the same with life. I mean, with the pandemic, I think it's easy to get caught up in maybe missed experiences or relationships, but, um, you know, looking forward and constantly looking at, you know, what can we do today and what can we do moving forward and how do we make up for, for some of those, you know, missed plays or calls or relationships is, um, you know, feels more proactive and feels more positive and, you know, really appreciative of, you know, all the people that we have in our lives. Absolutely. And you did that too. So I remember when pandemic hit, you guys were planning several family trips, which had to be on hold, but you just had one. How was it going away again? It was great. I mean, it was just really fun. We, uh, I really appreciated in the pandemic having more time with my family uh, that, you know, you don't realize how, how much time we spent away from each other uh, between work and school and events and all kinds of things, work, travel, And so I really appreciated having time with them um, and more intentional time with games and movies and puzzles and uh, going away on vacation was, uh, yeah, like a much needed extension of that, of experiencing, you move into Mexico, so experiencing zip lines and cenotes and, you know, all kinds of things together um, and making those memories and just having some time to be present for one another. It was pretty cool. Our, our hotel room we stayed in did not have a TV. Um, so we, yeah, so it was 
it was really nice. I mean, when we first got in there, it was like, oh goodness, what are we gonna do? Um, well, we didn't need it. You know, we had we brought a bunch of games and we just played games or took walks on the beach, played in the pool. Uh, we played a lot of shuffleboard. Um, the, the hotel had a shuffleboard table, and Morgan and Zoe became experts at it, and they they loved playing it and ping pong and pool. So it was, yeah, we had a great time. I love that, and I actually do like the the fact that you didn't have a TV. So it does make for more quality time with your family. I would assume. I don't have kids, but I feel like if I had kids, I would put them in front of the TV. <laughs> And kind of use it as a crutch. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, especially there was we were there for a wedding. So there were definitely times when Jake and I um, went to a cocktail party, you know, that was just for adults or uh, the wedding was just for um, Jake and I. And so we were worried about what they were going to do if they would get bored. But no, they played games. They had fun. They were silly. Uh, they rested up a lot because we had some pretty tiring days, but you just have to, I think, you know, be agile in those situations and uh, use what's at your disposal. And it reminds me of this article I was reading this week about our elected officials and particularly women uh, who are new mothers and are, you know, still pumping breast milk for their babies and how many challenges they have in finding lactation rooms and space to pump or to get their milk home. And it, it, it's, it, you know, it's in one way, I, it, I'm going to say it's not surprising, which I know is not the right response um, because, you know, for so long we had a lack of you know, representation and diverse representation in elected offices. And so you have these structures that weren't built for, for women and for moms. Um, but then I know in my own experience, Maricela, you may remember this. We were in a co-working space when I uh, had had Zoe. And in order to use the lactation room in the co-working space, you had to like book the room and hope it was available and, you know, do all this work and go through all these hoops to, to try and be able to find a space uh, to pump and, and on the schedule that made sense for you. And so I ended up just pumping. Uh, Cause it was just you and Allison and I, I think at the time um, and, and Tina uh, just pumping in our office. And it was such a weird experience to, you know, have a child in this day and age and just not have that ability uh, to find a place to pump. So I, I really, I wanted to call out this article because I really um, resonated with these um, legislators and, and what they're going through, especially uh, when it comes to to being moms and, and, you know, pumping and providing food for their babies. I remember very well when you had Zoe and we were at that co-working space and there was just not a, like anything that was really set up for moms. Or if it was, it was very little for the amount of uh, people in that office or co-working space. Um, I can't imagine how, and I know the exactly the article that you're talking about. And I, and I think one of the lawmakers actually kind of ran for a vote while still even like pumping uh, because that's kind of the only like that's what she had to do and she wanted to be a present for the vote and had her voice heard um so if it was so hard for you and for people in corporate world and it's so hard for people in politics how are we expected to see representation that we want to see like, how does this not deter more people who are young mothers or who are planning on having kids to run for office or to, you know, go and try and build a career? And I think the corporate world, I, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I think it might be a step ahead <laughs> from um, office on this in this sense, but it, it, it really is startling and like for me I it's not something I've had to deal with so it's not something I would ever think about um, which is wrong 
um, I even have to have to remind myself, like, these are things that we all have to keep in mind. Yeah, I mean, it's, listen, I, I think across the spectrum of business, there, there's a lot of nuances depending on, I mean, I think leadership of your company, right? So it, as a, a caregiver myself, like I thought a lot about that with Elevate and Elevate's policies to make sure that uh, our employees didn't have the experiences I had, which was, oh my gosh, I'm pregnant and we have no maternity leave policy and I don't know what that means for me. And now I have to advocate for one and try and create one at, um, at previous employers. So it, it comes from leadership and their lived experiences or, or their awareness and passion um, or understanding of the needs of others uh, with different experiences. I think also bigger companies you know, have adopted certainly lactation rooms and, and maybe maternity leave policies or caregiver policies um, because they have more employees. It's a bigger representation of their population. But as you start to get into smaller companies um, and particularly, you know, these smaller like startups or, or um, you know, mid-tier companies where maybe only, you know, a, a few employees uh, would need a lactation room, for example then uh, it becomes less of a priority. It becomes more ad hoc. It's like, oh, we're going to turn this closet into something you can use, uh, which which doesn't feel great for employees. And, and there's been a lot of uh, research as well and, and commentary around, particularly in less corporate environments, and maybe, oh, you can use the bathroom. You know, we'll put a chair in the bathroom. We can go in a stall. Um, and, and feeling like that's okay. And so you're constantly trying to advocate for yourself and, and for your situation. And um, that can feel, I think, very daunting, particularly if you're in the situation for the first time and it's new. And so it's back to these legislators who I think are, are one, adapting to the situation that they're in. Um, they are, you know, advocating for change. And they're also just saying, like, this is, this is, the way it is like this is you know um my my life or i'm i'm pumping i'm you know needing to feed my baby and i'm not going to hide from that or shy away either it should be front and center um for all the legislators because that's how we also build empathy we build awareness and we build action and change empathy keyword right and like you were saying about it being the leadership's lived experience that's where empathy has to come in. So it's it has it doesn't have to be just about lived experience, but about understanding and being able to empathize with others' experiences. So just as you know, you had your lived experience as a parent. Like I'm sure you empathize with other people who don't. Or I know what we've talked about my situation too. And as a you know, woman in my uh, late 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 (laughs) thirties who doesn't have kids and what, you know, that means for me and my needs within the workplace. And I think that that's conversations that everyone should be having with their employees. And let's, let's figure out uh, what, you know, what people need. It's we as employers tend to, you know, it's like, Ooh, here's like a new shiny benefit. Uh, We can do a chocolate tasting or a happy hour or whatever it is. Um, But really, going deeper and saying, okay, you know, what, who is in our, our workforce and how, you know, I mean, you should have a good diverse uh, representation across the board, but but what do they need to make this a place that is inclusive where they feel that they belong, where they feel like they're seen and heard and supported and how do we take steps every day to really create that culture of belonging uh, in a place where, you know, people feel like they don't have to hide a part of them or that, um, you know, they don't have to constantly advocate for themselves, but they're in a place that already is putting their needs and their identities first. Yep. hundred percent. Well, today's guest, I'm really excited about Sarah Sheehan is the co-founder and president of Bravely and her background in HR and as a sales leader, have made her passionate about helping companies build healthy cultures. So just like you and I were just talking about, Maricela, this, this idea of you know companies supporting employees, obviously legislators and, and Congress supporting 
uh, elected officials, um, you know, across the board, wherever we are, finding places where we can thrive and grow and show up as our true selves. Uh, Sarah and I definitely talk uh, about how we can put that into action and what are some ways companies can build healthy cultures. So let's get to an interview with Sarah. Hello, Sarah, and welcome to the Elevate podcast. Hi, Christy. Thank you so much for having me. I am super excited to be here. I was listening to a few of your podcasts before today, and it, it got me really jazzed um, to talk to you. Excellent. And I also love the word jazz. So we're off to a good start. Uh, Sarah, share a bit with our listeners about who you are and how you got to where you are today. I would love to. So I am the business that I founded. I'm, I'm the co-founder and president of a company called Bravely. And we are a platform that's trying to disrupt the traditional coaching model uh, that many of us are familiar with. So typically coaching has only been available to the senior most level executives inside a company who are often not the most diverse set of people. And it bravely, we believe that everyone deserves access to a resource like coaching. So we go population wide um, in the hopes that everyone at every level um, of every background gets access. Um, and the, the road that led me here um, was not a straight one, as it is for many of us. Um, but I actually started my career, I feel like I should, I should tell like, the very beginning story. So when I moved to New York, I was desperately, I had been working in publishing and I was desperately trying to just find a different role um, where I could get into a more corporate environment. And I was interviewing countless times for a role at Sirius Radio. It hadn't merged with Sirius XM yet. And it was an administrative assistant role. And they kept telling me I was overqualified. And I kept going back and asking if I could meet other people in the team because I really felt like I was the right fit. Um, and I finally met with a woman who really created, honestly, the safety for me to tell her my story in that interview. And because of that, she gave me the job. And the role that I took there was, if you looked at an organizational chart, it was literally the lowest role on the chart. It was the administrative assistant to the facilities and mailroom. And it was, it ended up being honestly the job of my dreams because I was able to touch and interact with every single employee at the company. And that allowed me the ability to get in front of even more senior level people and continue to grow and eventually get elevated. And that person that hired me, uh, her name is Sarah Patterson. She's a chief people officer now. She ended up being a lifelong mentor very close friend and someone who has been instrumental in helping open doors for me. Um, and I feel like that's such an important story to tell because for so many of us, we don't get to where we are without the help um, and, and really, I, I think like standing on the backs of other people often helps us get to the next level in terms of where we're going. Um, so that's where my career started. And when I was at Sirius, um, I did a lot of different roles. And then I ended up landing in the HR department. Um, and I spent about 10 years working in that practice, which gave me an incredible foundation for building my company. And I really started to understand like what made companies thrive, like in terms of like, how do they get their employees to plug in and engage? How do they retain people? Um, and, you know, it was in that role that I really started to understand the challenges that organizations face in terms of their people. Um, and I, I held a couple of other jobs between Sirius and then moving on to what was my first startup. It was a company called The Guilt Group in New York. And it was at the time sort of the first billion dollar unicorn company to, to hit New York. And everyone wanted to work there. It was unbelievably successful at the time in terms of their growth. Um, and I was lucky enough 
to get an opportunity there on the HR side of things again. And did a complete career switch when I was there, though. I, I pitched myself to the CEO to move from HR to sales and launch uh, one of their new verticals that was um, kind of like a high-end answer to Groupon and had to really find the courage because at the time I was absolutely suffering from what I would define as imposter syndrome uh, to convince him that the jobs that I was doing were perfectly suited for me to move over into a sales role. And, and thankfully, he took a chance on me um, and it changed the trajectory of my career. I, I started doing something completely different and ended up uh, over the course of the next three years growing that business from nothing to $60 million and then leading an entire sales team. So I had never managed people before and then found myself managing a large distributed sales organization. And so all of this is, is sort of the ingredients, I would say, that prepared me for founding Bravely because I really saw firsthand when I was managing and leading others how important it was to give them the support in the moment that things were happening for them. And sometimes they weren't comfortable having me be that support or HR. Uh, and they often would go to the wrong places, which are their colleagues or people in their personal life who are well-meaning, but not equipped to give them that intervention that they need right in that moment. And that was truly the foundation for me founding Bravely uh, with my co-founder, which is that you know we wanted we're able to access so many things in our lives at a moment's notice, except in the area that we need it the most, which is at work. I, I couldn't agree more. I, I want to unpack a, a couple of questions here, actually. So, you know, the two are, are connected, but we'll start with moving into a sales role. And, and the reason I bring this up is I know that there is often a, um, lack of gender diversity within sales, um, particularly when you get move outside of like retail sales. Um, so working within an organization, I also was a head of sales and led a sales team and one of uh, the few women on the team. And it's somewhat mind boggling to me because I think that sales is so much about relationships in which we really, as women, invest in that a lot and, and we're really good at it. Um, but there is that that imposter syndrome, that confidence, that putting yourself out there, um, that, you know, trying to get someone to buy into uh, whatever it is, you know, you're selling, which I think is intimidating. And I'm just curious, like, what were some of your motivations for moving into that sales role? And do you see some of those similar themes within your team? Yeah, I think, you know, my motivation at the time was really the product. I was focusing on selling small businesses in New York. And I was, my father was born and raised in New York. My grandfather was a New York City bus driver. Like it really like came from the inside out, me wanting to take this role. Um, and I was super passionate about it for that reason, thankfully. Like I had that um, to stand on. Um, but all the things that you're describing, I've experienced. I've experienced it in every role, I would say since then, where I've experienced it raising money, I've experienced it in sales roles, where you are definitely seen, like you, you, I had to tap into something really different when I was out there in a competitive field and continuing to be promoted and having to, to make sure that um, I was driving productivity, hitting numbers, but still I think interestingly, appearing to be like this glamorous woman that had it all together, um, which I found to be incredibly challenging at the time, <laughs> especially for the company that I was working at. It was like a very sexy company. And uh, the job I was doing, as you probably know, like sales, it's it can be a, a slog, like you're constantly just chasing and chasing and so for me, I think like having to, to feel like I still had to present a certain way and, and also like be responsible for such an enormous amount of revenue 
and for such a large team was definitely uh, challenging. Yeah, and it's also a role that is much more transparent in terms of, you know, transparent just from a like a KPI measurement standpoint, but also within the company operations of whether you're succeeding or failing, right? Because revenue targets are always, I think, pretty front and center, big leaders within the organization. And so your your spotlight is, is right on you about are you hitting these goals and and if not, why? Yeah, and you have to be super aggressive about hitting them. Um, and that's what people are looking for. But I think my approach was quite different and that's what set me apart from the rest. And again, built the foundation for my company. I am definitely someone who has that like killer instinct that wants to win. But the way that I did it was focusing on my people. It was really understanding what each individual needed to thrive or what they were looking for in terms of their own development or, you know, the, their, the keys to their success were different than maybe their colleagues. And so it was not something that I would call scalable when you were talking about, you know, a 60 plus person sales team, but I, I tried to enable the people who reported to me to do the same by modeling that. So, uh, I, I still to this day think that this is even now more than ever, like this individualized approach to performance, to support. It's really the key to driving people and, and helping them unlock their potential. So with Bravely, what have been some of the biggest surprises for you? Well, the last two years have been incredibly enlightening, as you can imagine. Like from just from a business perspective, I think like how difficult it is to build a business continues to surprise me. Um, when you're a mission driven company like ours, when you know that what you're doing has an impact, you know, one problem we don't have is the impact that we're delivering. So, you know, we maintain 4.8 out of five star ratings for our coaching sessions. You know, every day I wake up and read the feedback from employees, which at times brings me to tears. Like I know that we, the work that we're doing matters and is high impact, but figuring out the next step, no one really has the answers. All you can do is, you know, try and use as much data as possible to inform your decisions um, and learn to really follow your instincts and and listen to your clients. So from a business perspective, I think, you know, just the mountain does not get any less steep. And so I think that that's something that I've had to adjust to over the last few years. Um, and then just from the, the perspective of the work that we're doing, um, you know, the last two years have been incredibly hard on employees, people, you know, people everywhere. Right. But as, as it relates to our work, um, it's just been incredibly challenging because we've, we have to find that resilience every day. And by nature of what we do at Bravely, like we are faced with helping people figure that out. Um, and I've been surprised by the amount of people who are coming to us about, to talk about stress and burnout, but who are also still incredibly committed to their own development and figuring out how to get to the next level. So I would have thought, you know, if someone had presented the, the future circumstances to me, that it would be incredibly difficult for someone to experience the levels of burnout, anxiety, stress that we all have, and still be shooting for the stars. And what we've learned through all the sessions, tens of thousands of sessions that we've held, is that those things are not separate, that they can coexist. Um, and it's, I think, really reframed how we think about supporting people. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'll i say personally that um, that resonates. I mean, I, 
I, I was talking to a friend the other day and, and we both resonated with this idea that it's felt um, in the past you know, two years, particularly as if you're running underwater, you know, and, and yes, like we're reacting to so many situations and blocking and tackling and just trying to make it through this changing times, but yeah, you want to continue to move forward and it feels like you're just like running and not moving um, and spinning your wheels. And, you know, partially, I, I, I don't know, I can only surmise. I mean, I think it's, it's a bandwidth issue. It's a focus issue. I think it's a burnout issue. I think it's, you know, I, I, it's, it's even a direction um, because the, the direction we thought we were running in before, which seemed clearer is less clear now and priorities have changed and the world has shifted. And I mean, there's just so many different moving factors that it's, I don't know, it, it is hard to know where you're going and how to get there. And yet you, you want to feel like we're moving and not continuing to just react and be stuck in this, this moment and in this time. Yeah. And that's really all we're trying to help people do day to day through our coaching. And I will just say personally, you know, I haven't given myself, I don't think the space to reflect on all that has changed. Like my world has completely changed since the pandemic. I became a mother three months before the pandemic hit. I was a couple of days back from parental leave. And then we sent everyone home never to return. Uh, didn't have childcare for the first 15 months of my daughter's life. And, you know, that idea of I've still got to like, I, now that I think about the data that I was just sharing with you about burnout, but still wanting to get to that next level, like I can personally relate to that. Uh, because I absolutely was run down, but feeling like I was never doing enough and wanting to make sure that I maintained, you know, this certain level of performance. And once I decided to stop doing that or stop beating myself up for not hitting these imaginary targets in my mind, um, I was able to really start I think to lead the way that I've always wanted to and give other people the space to share their own imperfections and, um, you know, the challenges that they felt they weren't able to overcome and have been able to maintain that now, you know, for the last, I would say it was six months into the pandemic when I finally decided to just like stop pretending that I had it all together um, but I still don't think that collectively we've, we've ref been able to reflect on what has happened. Um, and we're still just trying, like you said, to keep going and, and run when we really need to pause, but it's, it's hard to, to press that pause button. Oh, it is. I mean, it's hard when you, you know, for so many reasons, when you are, you know, type A and ambitious and you have your goals and you want to move forward. Um, I think it's also really hard as a business owner, leader, manager, uh, because during this time, you know, and I'll be totally transparent. I mean, one of the things that was so hard for me during this time is like, I didn't have the answers. You know, I didn't have the answers for my family. I didn't have the answers for my business, for my employees. I mean, there was so many unknowns. Things kept changing. And yet people look at you for the answers because we're all looking at to somebody to give us that type of security and that type of confidence that, you know, we'll get through this. And so as a leader, you're dealing with so many things and navigating the uncertainty in business, the uncertainty in, in your career, in your life, and yet also have your teams who are looking to you for that sense of, you know, calm and answers and direction and okay like we're the captain of the ship and we're gonna steer it through the storm and we've got this and let's go and you know and also a leader who is you know compassionate to their own lived experiences and what they're going through and it you know I think for all of us we grew quite a bit in many ways and it changed perspective but 
the the sheer weight on our shoulders was was pretty pretty overwhelming and you know back to kind of the work you're doing at bravely i can see why that is important because we're navigating situations we we haven't before and we don't necessarily have the tools to do that and being able to to talk to someone and tap into someone else's expertise and experience as we're going through this makes you know, one, you know, feel less, less alone, but also, you know, arm you with the tools and insights um, you need to, to best weather the storm. Absolutely. And what I experienced is different from what you experienced, which is different from, you know, it, everyone has had a completely different set of circumstances and continues to experience that. But I think the difference is, is that, you know, prior to two years ago, we weren't able to talk about that. So when I think about back in my sales days, which by the way, was truly the Camelot of my work experience before Bradley. So I, I wouldn't trade it for the world. I loved every minute of it, but like there was no not showing up. There was no sharing what was really going on. Um, and, you know, asking for flexibility or accommodations, like it just didn't really exist in the workplace and it should have, right? So what's happened is that the light has been shined on something and for women, I mean, we could, let's just extend this conversation for the next two hours to talk about the impact that it's had on women the last two years, but we've always sort of towed that line. We've always had to show up and make everything look seamless and easy when we're responsible for, you know, heavy loads at home and, uh, not really getting the resources that we deserve through our workplace to support being a mother or a parent in general. So, you know, I think the the light has been shined upon the workplace and we can't go back to separating the personal from the professional. And then, you know, that brings me back to this idea of individualized support. So, you know, I have a a cousin who works in Manhattan is thriving in her career, is single, but has had to take on a huge amount of work in the last two years because of the circumstances of some of the other folks on her team who are parents. And that's a very stressful and valid set of circumstances, which were the opposite of mine as a new mother, right? But when you look at the two of them, there should be no difference in terms of the accommodations or flexibility that that we offer to the two. And so I think the future now and the challenge is how do companies see these nuances in people's lives and figure out how to support them? It's not these blanket resources and benefits that are one size fit all. It's how, how do you, Christy, and you, Sarah, need to be supported differently? And what are the resources that we need to offer to meet those needs? And what are you hearing from companies? I mean, are they acknowledging that this is a need and and putting the work behind that? I think that they understand that it's, it's required now because everyone's bleeding talent. Everyone's losing people. And it's not just because they're getting more money somewhere else. It's because employees don't feel like there's development opportunities for them, or they don't feel like, you know, as a parent, I have the flexibility that I need, or, you know, there's, again, there's different criteria that everyone is using to assess whether or not this is the right fit for them. And I mean, this feels, I'm sure to many organizations and like an impossible feat, but, you know, you, It's really about like creating a culture where you're giving people, managers, leadership, the agency to support their people in whatever way they need, you know, within certain boundaries, right? But I think everyone has historically just been so afraid about creating inequity, Um, you know, but for me, it's like in January you know, single mother on my team with three kids under five, they all are sent home because of COVID and she has no childcare. Like you think I'm not going to give this woman more 
flexibility and accommodation right now than someone else on my team because I'm afraid of, you know, how that might appear. We can't, we can't live in that world anymore. And I understand how complicated that makes things. But to me, it's about first building a culture that supports compassion at this level and then demonstrating it through your actions. I love all of that. Uh, Sarah, thank you so much for this. It's amazing work you're doing and very necessary. I want to end with just a few quick questions for you to get to know you a little bit better. Uh, What's your favorite day of the week? Saturday, because I get to be with my family and unwind for sure. Who would be your dream dinner guest? Dead, dead or alive? <laughs> Doesn't matter, whichever you choose. Uh, I, we ask this question of new hires at Bravely, um, and we let them choose. If I would say my grandfather. Do you have any pet peeves? I, I don't know if lying is a pet peeve. It's more of like a value, but you know, you're kind of like dead to me if, if you ever tell me a white lie. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, do you have a favorite recent read? I'm reading uh, Jennifer Moss's book, The Burnout Epidemic, which is very uh, timely for this conversation. She and I are having a discussion. Um, and so I've been reading her book, which is, I highly recommend it. And do you have a final thought do you want to leave with our listeners here today? I think all I would say, just based on what we've talked about is, you know, there, there needs to be more leading with the heart within organizations. And that feels scary because that's not really how we've operated. Uh, and you've, you've got to help everyone at every level, you know, figure out the path forward. And you don't have to be in a leadership or an HR role to do that. You can mentor other people. Um, But bringing more of that compassionate lens to work, I think, is the path forward. Perfect. Thank you, Sarah, so much for joining us here today on the Elevate podcast. Thanks for having me. All right. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Maricela and I invite you to join us at other conversations happening within the Elevate community. Beyond the podcast, we have a host of phenomenal roundtables where you can connect in small groups with peers and talk about the, the issues and the goals that are relevant to you in your life on The next executive roundtable, we'll be uh, having a discussion around serving on a board, all the behind the scenes tips and tricks, insights and advice that you need to know on your board journey. At the Rising Leaders Roundtable, we will be talking about dealing with and preventing burnout. Very, very important. I think many of us are feeling increased burnout. Uh, There's recently a Deloitte research that came out that showed that burnout is growing uh, amongst women and, and women in the workforce, um, not, not getting better. Uh, so we want to make sure we're addressing this and, and helping you to navigate these times. And then our entrepreneur and business owner roundtable, we'll be talking about what's in a name. For your business, it's a lot. How to name your business and your products, your services, and your offerings to help uh, grow and scale your business. I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I'm obviously really looking forward to the Rising Leaders one, dealing with and preventing burnout, not just because I lead it and I'm biased, but because I think it's a very, very relevant topic. Like It, it, it absolutely is. Uh, and you and I even talked about this when with our trip. I said I had a hard time relaxing, um, and that's that's a bummer, but I, I, I think it's partially once you hit this degree of burnout, it takes time uh, to come back from that. And so we really have seen firsthand how burnout impacts each of us in in the workforce and in the work we do and in our lives. We want to make sure we're being real about that and providing the advice and support that we all need to um, to prevent it, to overcome it, and to move forward. Uh, So beyond the roundtables, and please join us, you can find out more at elevatenetwork.com. We also have our Mobilize Women Summit coming up this June. 
And just like Marisol and I were talking about building an inclusive culture uh, today, we talked a lot about, you know, creating change in the workplace and the world. These are all conversations that continue on during Mobilize Women. And Marisol, could you share a bit more about how our listeners can register for this free, amazing, impactful event? Yeah, I mean, don't get me started about Mobilize Women because you won't get me to shut up. Um, it is my one of my passions and one of the things I enjoy the most about our work at Elevate, which is really taking this day to dig deep into conversations that really make a difference in our world. This will be taking place on June 8th. It is fully virtual and completely free to attend. It's a full day of sessions, and we're going to be talking about everything from the changing landscape of mental health and new therapies that are coming up there in that space, as well as um, companies that are looking to disrupt the space to give more access to people who have not had access to mental health care um, or have not been as engaged with the mental health care space. So very, very relevant for the conversation of burnout. We'll also be talking about how we can be true allies and not just have um, performative allyship within companies. We're going to talk about changes in the law in different areas and in different places and how that affects minorities. And we'll be talking about why people stay. Why are they staying in their companies? What is the role of companies in our employees' well-being? And I think it'll be relevant for everyone. You can register completely free at elevatenetwork.com forward slash summit. All right. Excellent. And before we close out for the day, we cannot forget our first section, uh, the f- women who are making history, leading the way and breaking those glass ceilings. So we want to celebrate Alyssa Nacken, who became the first woman MLB coach to make an on-field appearance. And Carolyn Galloway, who became the first woman and first person of color to become a municipal court judge in the city of Anderson, South Carolina. Valerie Shears Ashby became the first woman president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Kirsten Bivens Domingo became the first black editor in chief of the Journal of the American Medical Association. Wei Hushrao became the first woman captain of a warship in the Chinese Navy. Wendy Mastica Hartman became the first woman promoted to division chief of the Buffalo Fire Department. All right, so we celebrate all of these firsts, and we hope you'll share your first with us. You can always reach us on social media. Tell us about your successes. We would love to celebrate them here. And next week, we'll be back with an interview with Madeline Schwartz, a strategic communication advisor and corporate trainer who helps individuals and teams communicate with confidence so they can reduce conflict, increase creative output, and re-energize teams. She's helped hundreds of professionals speak clearly and concisely and work with organizations such as MasterCard, Etsy, and the Jewish Museum. See you back here next week. Thanks so much for listening to Elevate. If you like what you hear, help a girl out. Subscribe to the Elevate podcast on iTunes. Give us five stars and share your review. Also, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Elevate NTWK. That's Elevate Network. And become a member. You can learn all about membership and all the great things that Elevate Network is doing at our website, www.elevatenetwork.com that's e-l-l-e-v-a-t-e network.com and special thanks to our producer Catherine Heller she rocks and to our voiceover artist Rachel Griesinger thanks so much and join us next week